Hi all, in this video we are going to see about examination of cardiovascular system. Now before we move on to the topic proper, I would like to remind you that this, is, this video is exclusively for first year medical students because we are not going to talk much about how to examine the abnormal findings. We are going to stick on to what the normal findings are and how to examine them. So when once you move to your medicine posting, you will be learning more about the examination of different systems. So this is the basic one which a first year MBBS student must know to, uh, to appear for their practical examinations. So whatever system is, uh, whenever you have to examine any system, you have to write a report in which it should contain the biodata, the general examination as well, including the vital signs that is pulse, uh, blood pressure, respiratory rate, the temperature all must be there so for in CVS also you have to examine the initial things the general examination the vital signs of which the pulse should be done in detail because since we are examining the cardiovascular system examination of pulse including all its uh, different attributes like the rate of pulse rhythm character volume conditions of vessel wall radio femoral delay other peripheral pulsations all must be checked thoroughly now I've done a separate video on how to examine the pulse as well as the other vital signs so I'm not repeating it here. Similarly another important uh, thing to examine is the examination of neck veins for jugular venous pulsations. So this also I've done a separate video on how to examine JVP. So go through that also because pulse and JVP are important components of examination of cardiovascular system. And next, in this video, we'll be basically talking about the examination of the precordium, that is, uh, which is a main part of cardiovascular system examination. So let's start. What do you mean by precordium? Precordium is an anterior part of the chest wall which overlies the heart. So it is this area that overlies the heart, that is known as precordium. Now, how do we examine precordium? We've got four steps to examine the precordium, that is, inspection, palpation percussion as well as auscultation. So this is the systematic way of how to examine whatever system it is. Even in respiratory system or GIT, we've got these four steps, inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation. Now what to inspect? So in inspection, first we have to check the shape of the precordium. Now what I've shown is an abnormal shape. You can see that obviously this is not normal. So you have to see if the shape of the precordium is normal. You have to see if there are any engorged veins. Like in this picture, you can see that there are engorged veins here. See if there are any engorged veins. And you have to see. So next, you have to check for any other pulsations, like uh, whether the apex beat or the apical impulse is visible. Now here you can see the apical impulse was visible here. Though so this is not a normal type of apex beat. This is how you might see an ap apical impulse or apex beat. And also see if there are any other pulsations. So these are the things that you have to check during inspection. The shape of precordium, engorged veins and pulsations. Next, we will move on to the palpation. So in palpation too, we have to check uh, four parameters. You have to check for the apex beat, thrill, left parasternal heave and other pulsations. So we will see each one by one. So what is meant by apex beat? Apex beat is defined as the lowermost and outermost point of definite cardiac impulse that can be best seen or felt in the precordium. So see if this is the heart. This lowermost and outermost point where a definite cardiac impulse can be seen is known as apex beat. Okay. So how to examine for this apex beat? So there's a systematic way by which we can examine the apex beat. For that, first we have to place the palm of the right hand flat over the left chest parallel to the ribs. So, and how far must you keep the palm? You have to the palm must be kept in such a way that the fingertips are in the mid axillary line. So you have to keep the palm like this flat such that the fingertips are in the mid axillary line and concentrate if you can feel any apical impulse. And then if you actually feel any apical impulse then you can localize it by placing your ulnar border of the palm for better localization. So you can just gradually just shift your uh, palm to this ulnar position and then concentrate whether you can find any impulse and if you can feel any impulse slowly localize it with the tip of your index finger like this okay so first you fell to the palm then with the ulna border and then gradually you 
pointed pointed dot of localize it using your tip of the index finger now just localizing the apex beat alone is not enough we have to know at what position it is present so for that you have to count the intercostal space with your left hand see here the person has localized with your index finger then using the other hand we have to count the intercostal spaces with the left hand so as to identify in which space the apex beat is so to count you can remember it as the space that is just below the sternal angle is the second intercostal space so from there you can count so first feel the sternal angle feel that rib and just below would be the second intercostal space and then the next space would be the third the next would be fourth fifth like that so thus we can identify in which space it is present not only the space we have to know if it is pushed medially or laterally so check its position in relation to the mid clavicular line now suppose it is not palpable you have to ask the patient to roll to the left lateral position so without moving your palm you can ask the patient to roll to the left lateral position and then find out the apical impulse so normal apex beat is usually present in the fifth intercostal space 1 cm medial to mid clavicular line so see suppose this is the heart you know this is the sternal angle the junction between the manubrium and the sternum is a sternal angle so corresponding to that just below the space just next to that would be the second intercostal space which means this would be the third this would be the fourth and this would be the fifth so it is in the fifth uh, space that apex beat is normally visible not only that it will be 1 cm medial to mid clavicular line so this is the clavicle so mid clavicular line means somewhere here like this you can see that it is medial almost 1 cm medial to mid clavicular line so that is the normal apex beat position so why should we check this uh, apex beat i mean isn't it all always in the fifth intercostal space 1 cm medial to mid clavicular line no it need not be in this fifth intercostal space 1 cm medial to mid clavicular line that could be a shift there are many conditions in which that can be a shift in the apex beat so that is why we are checking for where the uh, apex beat is located so some of the conditions in which the apex beat can be affected are pleural effusion or pneumothorax so in this case what happens so suppose there is a pleural effusion on this right side so what happens the mediastinum is pushed away which means the the apex beat would be shifted to the opposite side so that is why we say we have to know the horizontal as well as the vertical location of the apex beat because we want to know if it is just shifted uh, out outward or downward now, another condition in which the apex beat can be shifted is pulmonary fibrosis or lung collapse in this case the mediastinum will be pulled towards the affected sides that means the apex beat would be shifted to the same side so these are two conditions in which apex beat can be shifted not only this there are other conditions like left ventricular hypertrophy which is very commonly seen in this case the apex beat will be displaced downwards and laterally which means it would be it can even go up here to the sixth intercostal space or it can it can move downward as well as laterally another rare condition is dextrocardia in which the apex beat might be located on the right side and there are conditions like pregnancy ascites abdominal tumors in which the apex beat can be shifted upwards and in certain structural diseases like scoliosis and scyphosis also the position of apex beat may be altered so don't be under the impression that the apex beat will always be in the fifth intercostal space so first keep your palm localize where the apex beat is and then count to find out whether it's in the normal location or not so that was about palpation of the apex beat next we have to palpate for thrill what is thrill a palpable murmur is called thrill so see whenever there is a turbulence of blood flow there will be a vibrating sensation because of this turbulence of blood flow and that will be transmitted to the palpating hand and it is usually like a purring of a cat it feels like a purring of a cat so to palpate for thrill we have to keep uh, the palm over the apex and also on both sides of the uh, sternum and see if there is any palpable murmur that is thrill now to be frank thrill is an abnormal finding it is only when that there is a murmur that you, you might get a thrill in fact there are a lot of points regarding a thrill like whether it's a systolic diastolic where all you should check there are finer points regarding to this but it is at the level of physiology you need not go into the details at a first year level you need not go into the details of that but once you get into medicine you will be learning about all those
okay at, at a first year mbbs level at least you should know what is thrill and how to um, palpate for thrill in a very general manner so next we will see about left parasternal heave now this also is an abnormal finding it is usually seen in the right ventricular hypertrophy whenever the right ventricle gets big you might get a left parasternal heave so to examine this you have to place the ulna border of hand firmly over the left parasternal area parasternal means near the sternum so on the left side near the sternum you have to keep your ulna border of the hand like this and if there is right ventricular hypertrophy there will be brief lift to the hand okay so that is meant by left parasternal heave and finally you have to check for other pulsations also in the precordium so these are the four points that you have to check for palpation apex beat thrill left parasternal heave and other pulsations so next we'll move on to a third topic which is percussion so what are we going to percuss in this cardiovascular system examination we are going to percuss the heart borders we are going to percuss the right border left upper and lower border remember percussion of the heart borders is very obsolete now it is not done routinely nowadays but still as a part of an examination we should have an idea of what this is so that is why i am mentioning it right now clinically this is not very relevant and it is not usually done by the clinicians so to percuss for the right border we have to first percuss the liver dullness so from top you can percuss out the liver dullness that means you percuss each intercostal space and once above you in fact if there is just lung tissue you will get a resonant note and if there is a liver tissue you will get a dull note so once you get a dull note in fact you can ask the patient to inspire so that the area which was once dull would now become resonant because the liver moves down during inspiration so you have to percuss for the liver dullness first and after that you have to percuss you have to change the orientation of the hand like this why should you change the orientation of the hand remember the percussion should be always be done parallel to the border of the organ to be percussed so you we know that the heart is the look the orientation of the heart right border is vertical so naturally we have to keep the fingers vertical and from the mid axillary line to the right sternal border we have to percuss in all the spaces about the place where you got the liver dullness okay so it is normally done in the third to sixth intercostal spaces and normally the right heart border will correspond to the right sternal border okay it should not be beyond the right sternal border no, normally we get the dullness when the sternum is reached so that is how you percuss for the right heart border next we move on to the left border of heart left border means this okay we had just finished how to percuss the right border in which we said we'll percuss the upper border of liver and once we get the dullness there we we change the orientation of the finger and then percuss out each space okay from third to sixth space and find out whether it's corresponding to the right sternal border so that was how we check for right border now this is our left border so how will we percuss the left border for that we have to percuss in the fifth left intercostal space from the mid axillary line so from this space in the mid axillary line we are going to percuss like this okay so that we get where the apex beat is now once we get the apex beat a uh, normally a curved line from the apex to the second left coastal cartilage that would be the left border so the, from the apex beat to the second left coastal cartilage 4 cm from the medial line that would be the left border of the heart right now how will we find out the lower border the lower border of the heart map which means this border here that would correspond to the line drawn from the sixth right intercostal space intercostal cartilage near the sternum to the apex so from the sixth coastal cartilage near the sternum to the apex that would be the lower border and finally what about upper border the upper border corresponds to the second left intercostal space so this here the second left intercostal space would be the upper border of the heart now why are we talking so much about this percussion of heart borders so sometimes in case of conditions like pericardial effusion or cardiomegaly this area of cardiac dullness can be increased okay 
and some, sometimes in certain diseases like emphysema and all the area of cardiac dullness would be decreased so there can be a change in this cardiac dullness so that is why we are learning about it and as i said it is obsolete now but we it is good that you know how to focus out the heart borders and thus we've come to the last step which is auscultation so where all should we auscultate which are the different auscultating areas so in fact we've got four definite locations which are which are the mitral area tricuspid area pulmonary area as well as aortic area they are these are the different areas at which we have to auscultate now remember auscultatory areas are not anatomical locations it is just these are the sites where the sounds are best heard okay remember they are they need not be an anatomical locations it is just that these are the areas where the sounds are usually best heard and not only that if there is a valvular incompetence or a valvular stenosis those are best heard at these sites so that is where we have specific locations to auscultate so now i'll just mention which are the different auscultatory areas and which is your location so first as i said we've got the aortic area and it is in this area that the aortic sounds produced by the aortic valve are best heard and the location is second intercostal second right intercostal space close to the sternum next we have got the mitral area which is in wherein we have the sound produced by the mitral valve maximum and that is located in the fifth left intercostal space 1 cm medial to the mid clavicular line which corresponds to our apex beat the normal location of apex beat then we've got the tricuspid area which is lower end of sternum to the left side it is the area where that sounds of the tricuspid valve are best heard and finally we've got the pulmonary area which is the second left intercostal space close to the sternum so thus aortic area pulmonary area tricuspid area as well as mitral area these are the four locations where we have to auscultate now what are we auscultating for what should we listen so basically we have to hear the heart sounds as the first and the second heart sound the first heart sound is usually low pitched soft and long it is due to the closure of the av valve and the sound is typically described as slub it is due to, so remember the first heart sound is due to closure of the av valves the second heart sound is more high pitched sharp and short and due to the closure of the semilunar valves and it is the it is usually depicted as dub sound so first of all you have to listen to the first and ha second heart sound and also you should time it simultaneously by palpating for the carotid pulse so with one hand you can hold this death and with the other hand palpate for the carotid pulse so when we palpate with the carotid pulse you will know which one is s1 and which one is s2 because s1 usually occurs during the upstroke of the carotid pulse and s2 is usually just after this carotid pulse so like that you can know which is s1 and which is s2 so thus by auscultation you have to report the intensity of the heart sounds whether whether there are any splitting of heart sounds any murmurs or any added sounds and all this you have to mention in each area so in each area mitral sound which one is best heard s1 or s2 is there any added sound is there any murmurs any split so like that you have to mention in each of these areas so thus we've seen the inspection wherein we uh, saw what all to check for in the precordium whether the apical impulse is visible whether the shape is normal whether there are any engorged veins other pulsations then in the palpation we checked for four points we checked for apex beat thrill left parasternal heave and other pulsations then we percussed out the heart borders and finally we did the auscultation especially in the four areas so that's all in the examination of cardiovascular system thank you